Here at the Park Church of Christ, we believe that every moment is an opportunity to make a difference. It's not just about what we say, but what we do. And now, it's go time. When we come together as a church family and serve others, it's a powerful expression of God's love in action. Go time isn't just a missions campaign. It's a call to action. It's about stepping out of our comfort zones, and being the hands and feet of Jesus all over the world or right here at home. Join us as we mobilize for mission. Together, we can make a lasting impact and spread hope to those in need. It's go time. Go time here at our church is because we understand that our Lord was crystal clear on His mission, Luke 19, to seek and save the lost. We also understand that He was crystal clear on our mission to go and make disciples. So beginning today, we are going to take this month to hone in on the mission of this church. It's something we do all the time. But it has become the annual rhythm of our church in the spring to take an entire month, beginning today, which will conclude on May 5th, as the young men spoke of earlier, with a day where we will fund, God through us, fund the mission program of this church through giving and through pledges for the entire year. We take one Sunday, May 5th, where our offering doesn't pay for the the light bills or the lawn mowers or for our, our minister salaries or whatever else may be needed in the life of this church. On May 5th, everything we give is about going and supporting those who are going to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Quick history for those who are new to our body and those who are guests. It was in 2006, 18 years ago, that under the guidance and leadership of our shepherds and our missions committee led by Tom and Leslie Walden, that a missions program was begun titled Sowing for Eternity. They set a big goal out there of $100,000. Could this church give and pledge towards $100,000 for an annual missions budget to go out and make disciples? We had never done anything like that before. We had given a vehicle, a a bus to a church in need and a one-time offering. Well, that day came around and that number was announced and you could hear the gasp that went through the room when almost $300,000 was given and pledged towards missions. And each year since that time, this church has been about setting a day aside to give towards missions. Since then... Almost $13 million from this body of believers, from God through this body of believers, has been sent out in our city, our state, our nation, and our world to support people knowing Jesus Christ. We now have missionaries on six continents. We're still looking for that guy to go to Antarctica. (laughs) But on six continents... I mean, when you hear Serbia and you hear Central America and you hear the work in Brasilia and and New Zealand and other places, the reach of God through this body of believers is vast and varied. Now, this year we're we're changing the name from Sowing for Eternity because there's some of you that believe that Sowing for Eternity is our quilting group. And and we, 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 we don't want you to sow for eternity in that way, though that'd be good. And so we're cutting to the chase. We're talking about missions. It's a missions emphasis month. Our shepherds this past Wednesday night, through prayer, decided that the goal for this coming May 5th is going to be $815,000. Our God is going to have no problem with that. Amen, church? And we look forward. We, church, let me just be honest. We look forward in a culture where many churches, and I'm not throwing shade here, it's a fact of the matter, when many churches are drawing back, that this body of believers is trusting and believing in a God that is moving forward, that is about the business of all coming to know about His one and only Son, Jesus Christ our King. 
And so today, if you'd be turning in your Bibles to Matthew 28, we come to that passage known as the Great Commission, and it's perfect timing today. We, we've never, in the life of our sowing for eternity, or this now what we're calling Missions Emphasis Month, had better timing. Because never have we begun this campaign on the Sunday after what our world knows as Easter. The week after what we know is the day we celebrate as his resurrection. Well, Mitch, why would that be good timing? Because it was in this period after his resurrection that Jesus walked around alive and well for 40 days giving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people a front row seat to be eyewitnesses that he who was crucified, dead and buried, was alive again. And here we are, after that time where we have, as a world, celebrated his resurrection, and we celebrate it every day. But on the calendar of events, here we are as a people, mindful that in those 40 days, now, now get this one, in those 40 days, Jesus had a lot of meetings. He bumped into a lot of people. We can only imagine. But there was only one scheduled meeting. And at that one scheduled meeting, there was only one message. And boy, on that, I'm like, man, that must have been something. In 40 days, he could have brought them together and told them this new parable or that new parable or reminded them of another parable or another teaching or another warning. But on one scheduled meeting with one message, he said this. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all, everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. My mom used to have an expression. She'd say, that's like water off a duck's back. Y'all ever heard that before? Water off a duck's back. What's that mean? Not much impact. Not much influence. Literally, that water does not soak in. It just rolls off. That's the way God intended it to be. That is completely different than what God intended this message to be for our lives. And there are times I can read from this one meeting, this one message, this one command, an invitation from God, and it is almost as if it's water off a duck's back. Before we can be impacted by what we call the Great Commission, church, let us first go back and be impacted by the Great Commissioner. If you would for a second. Many of us have been to Israel some of us, many of us have been there many times on those trips this church takes. Others of you have been there individually. As you get to that top of the Mount Arbel there at Galilee, which many of us believe had to be the mountain, almost no question was the mountain there they gathered at for that one meeting, for that one message. And as those 11 sat there waiting to hear what their Lord had to say, and I try to picture myself as, as Peter or James or John listening to the resurrected Lord, still trying to wrap my head around what's been going on with he who was dead and is now alive again. Don't you know that as he whisked his hand back and pointed towards all the world, I mean from the top of that mountain, I mean it is as if you can see all the world from there. You're so high above Galilee. And as he does his hand like this, and I try to picture myself as Peter, James, and John, or one of the other apostles, and he says, I want you to go to all the world. And right about here, that hand gets there. And you look, and you see that gaping hole still in his hand. And you literally picture 
part of your commission, viewing it through the hole in his hand. It begins to sink into you that the great commission is great because the great commissioner is great. He who was dead is alive again. And with holes in his hands, he is bidding you to go and make disciples. Romans 1 and 4. Jesus who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by His resurrection from the dead. He is Jesus Christ, Messiah, King, our Lord. It's go time because we, number one, are in awe of who is giving the commission. This is none other than the Son of God. And in so being, this is none other than God Himself. The message is great because the one conducting the meeting is great. This one itinerant carpenter is not only carpenter rabbi, he is Christ King, but it also dawns on you That he is also in being God fully. He is creator God as well. I wonder if Jesus allowed that commissioning there on that mountain to go from the afternoon into the early evening. And I wonder if with the absence of the light pollution we have today, if those stars didn't begin to come out. And I wonder as he was saying, go to all nations if it didn't dawn on some of those disciples and apostles as they looked at those stars beginning to creep out above that Galilean sky, that Psalm 33 didn't come back to them in verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. He who spoke and it came to be, he commanded and it stood firm. It became, in other words, reality. That which was not real became tangible. The heavens and the starry hosts were made. Now, I know a lot of you guys tomorrow are going to be looking up into the sky, all right? Yeah, you, you, you may even travel. Somebody go, what are you talking about? Well, I think we got a little event called an eclipse happening tomorrow, all right? Some of you may travel to a better site to see the totality. Some of you, like Mitch Wilburn, may watch on the news and go, boy, that's nice. <laughs> boy, look at that. Everything went dark for four minutes, all right? <laughs> yeah, you know, let me, if you are so inclined to think about the sky tomorrow, take up this endeavor. Reach down in your front yard, get past that grass, and get that little speck of sand. Mitch, we don't have sand. Okay, get that little speck of dirt. I'm talking speck of sand size piece of dirt. I mean, you, you, here you can see it. But once it gets to the full length on the tip of your finger, as your arm is fully extended, you can't even see that speck of sand anymore. Now, here's the other thing tomorrow. And, and you'll, be, you'll be reminded to do this. Because tomorrow, all you're going to hear, eclipse, 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 look up, don't look up, don't don't blind yourself, you know. They're giving you the warnings, you do this. That speck of sand in my field of view just blocked out 10,000 galaxies. Okay, now I need to pause for a moment to try to let that sink in on you. It didn't block out one galaxy, not part of a galaxy. In my field of view, that speck of sand at the tip of my finger, at my extended arm, blocked out 10,000 galaxies. Each of those galaxies, like our galaxy, the Milky Way, contains 100 billion to 400 billion stars. I've lost you and I've lost myself. That number was... What is that? That's a bunch. 
This God who is commissioner, commissioning us is this God who created that. We now know that there are literally more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on the planet earth. The commission is great because the commissioner is great. And until we're in awe of him, we will never be in awe of what he has told us to do. And so who does he give this commission to? Let's back up a couple verses. Matthew 28 and 16, immediately preceding what we just read. Then the 11, hmm, that's curious. I thought there were 12. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain Jesus told them to go to. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. Then Jesus, he came to them. Boy, the Bible doesn't pull any punches. Doesn't gloss it over. Well, where are the 12? One was infected, defected, departed, and turned against his Lord. Judas is gone. Well, out of those other 11, we know they all stood firm at the cross. Roman soldiers, back off. We're here for our Lord. Teachers of the law, Pharisees, be done with you. We're here to worship at his feet as he gives his life because we now understand what he had prophesied three times about this crucifixion. You say, Mitch, I don't remember the story going that way. There's a good reason you don't remember the story going that way. Because out of the 11 that remained, 10 were gone. Only John remained. Well, I thought it'd be their leader, Peter, that remained. No, he was bu busy denying Christ three times. Who is this group? When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now, now catch that last line. Because about the time you think, but Mitch, that's who the 11 were. Now they're rock solid. Now they've pulled it back together. Now the 11 are ready to take on the world. When they saw him with those holes in his hands, when they had seen him for near 40 days alive and well, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Wait for it. Wait for it. How is Jesus going to react here on the mountain? And that's the last straw. You rockheads. You hard-hearted, slow to understand, sinful brood. I'm finally done with you and had, I've had enough with you. He doesn't do that. They saw him. They worshipped him. Some doubted him. And then he came to them. It's go time with this body of believers because we are in awe of who Jesus gives the commission to. They had slept. They had fled. They had denied. They had blown it. They had bowed out. And now they were still doubting and Jesus comes to them. It is to these disciples he gives the greatest calling that has ever been given. Jesus is so patient, so dedicated, so devoted, so forgiving, so willing to give second chances. Church, hear me. This is good news for us. Because the one person right now going, Mitch, I know everybody else can go on a mission trip, but you don't know what I've done. And Mitch, the sad thing is, is I can't even put it in the past tense. You don't know what I'm doing. I put it in the future tense. You don't know what I have plans to do. You don't think that Jesus knew that these 11 weren't going to be perfect? Well, I'm going to give you the commission now because from this day forward, you'll never sin again. From this day forward, you'll always believe, never doubt, never have an argument, and never have division. That's why I'm going to give you this commission. Wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whoever you've hung out with, he comes to you and he calls you. 
He calls you to the greatest mission that has ever been given. We are in awe of the one who gives a commission. We are in awe, number two, of who he gives a commission to. And then we begin to think, there's a lot of alls, A-L-L. A lot of alls in that great commission. All nations, all that I've commanded. But it's the two alls on the front end and the back end that bookend it that make all nations and all commands possible. (laughs) All authority has been given to me and I will always be with you. Let's read Matthew 28 and 20 together. And if I could, a little bit of change here, just so it hits you in a different way. And you can count on the fact that I am. Now I get it in the original Greek that the I am there is not a statement of God, Jehovah, Yahweh going with you. But there's something very powerful here in the English where the Spirit is conveying to the church today. And you can count on the fact that I am the none other than the I am God is with you all the way to the very end. The one who has all the authority in heaven and on earth will always be with you. It's go time. Because we believe and we are in awe of who is co-missioning with us. He not only tells us to go, but he promises to go with us. So as you go on the greatest, most radical, most life-giving mission that has ever been given, the greatest one, the commissioner himself that gives the commission says, I'm going with you, and I believe he does it in a way that is in spirit, try to stop me from going with you. Because those that you go to, I love more than you do. I've sent my one and only son to die for them. You couldn't keep me from going with you. But for me to go with you, I do need you to go. That's God's plan. There's no plan B. Well, if the church doesn't go, he's always been a God that'll shift to this or to that. That's not what the Bible says. The commission, the great commission, the great command and invitation is that we would go and share with others, baptizing all nations and making disciples, teaching them to obey everything that he has commanded by the power and presence of God going with us. Mitch, what's this partner with God called? What's this unbelievably empowered, called, and trusted individual called? A missionary? I'd be kind of right. An evangelist? I'd be kind of right. But the word the Bible uses is a disciple. It is not just one special called person. It is every disciple of Christ who is called to go and be a disciple, make disciples, and in so doing, mature as a disciple. Someone goes, that sounds like the mission statement of our church. Bingo, you've got it. We are called to be disciples. We are called to make disciples. The church, hear me on this one. And Mitch is maturing as a disciple. I'm going to decide to attend a seventh Bible study this year per week. That's not how you mature as a disciple. Reading the Bible, eating, so to speak, spiritually the Bible, is a massive foundational pillar part of it. But until you decide to let that Bible that is in you roll out through you to others, you are not yet maturing fully as a disciple of Christ. Because disciples are not only disciples, they make disciples, and in so doing, that's how they mature as disciples. Because it is in that process they become the body of Christ. 
And that is what full maturity as a Christian is. One who is each day by the power of the Spirit as He goes with you, His presence and power growing you and developing you more and more into Christ Himself as Christ lives in you. But Paul say, I no longer live. I don't live anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. So as a church, we talk a lot about being inviting, belonging, believing, and being baptized, being sacrificial, and the thing that makes it all work, being in prayer. We are not calling anyone in this church to do anything that Jesus has not already done for us. We have been invited to belong not only to a family, but to a force. The church moving out, being mobilized by the Spirit of God. To call others to believe in Him, which He has provided in His Son incarnate here on earth, teaching us to believe in what He not only has done, but what He is saying. Calling others God through us to be baptized, to die to self, to live in him. And the invitation today is this church, as we talk about go time, and being a church collective that focuses on missions. All those things are great. But until we are sacrificial and a church that is in prayer, these other things aren't going to happen. We have the opportunity this month and for the rest of our lives every day to be sacrificial unto the mission of Christ and be in prayer unto that end. And the invitation today is not so much come now as we stand and sing. Though if you need prayer, though as one is coming in our second assembly to be baptized in Christ, that invitation is always open. Today the invitation is for all of us this month to be in prayer how we might be sacrificial as a body to go now with the gospel of Christ. Church, let us stand and sing.